today I'll be talking about cryonics. And before I talk about cryonics, I'd like to provide you with some websites you can go to if you want to get more information. First off is my cryonics webpage, and the other is the Alcor website. The Alcor website has an excellent fact. It has a lot of, a lot of information on it, and it discusses a whole set of issues that uh, cover most of the questions that people, well, the frequently asked questions. So I'd recommend those. They're very good, and you can get a lot of information. So just to remind you of where we were yesterday with nanomedicine, disease and ill health are caused largely by damage to molecular and cellular level, but today's surgical tools are too big to deal with that. And in the future, we're going to have molecular tools that can actually deal with that directly, and we're going to have vast computational power with which to guide those tools. So, this is going to shift our medical imperatives. In particular, today, the way that you maintain the system in a functional state is you have the system self-repairing. So, when the system is functional, it can repair itself. As long as you are relying on self-repair, then when you lose the metabolic activities when the energy levels in the cell become low enough, the system is no longer able to self-repair itself, and you are now set on a declining trajectory from which you cannot recover. In the future, we will be able to repair passive structures. We will be able to repair structures that are not metabolizing, that are not functional. And as a consequence, we will be able to repair systems well beyond the point in time where we today say, oh, we are not able to repair or restore or revive that system. And because of this, we will be able to shift the medical imperatives dramatically. Instead of preserving function as the primary imperative, preserving the system so it can repair itself, we will be able to repair systems that are structurally intact. If you can recognize what the parts are, if you can figure out what is there, then you can restore those structures. So this is a huge shift in the medical imperative. And this shift is so large that people have said, hey, if that's going to be the case, then this thing called cryonics might actually work. Let's take a look at it. Well, cryonics has basically three parts to it. First part, you come in, for one reason or another, you are terminally ill, dying, unhealthy, whatever, and you have limited options, shall we say. Under those circumstances, you can be cryopreserved, cooled to the temperature of liquid nitrogen, and once you're at the temperature of liquid nitrogen, you enter the second phase, which basically is a phase where you are preserved in liquid nitrogen for some long period of time, decades, a century. It could be longer. Once you are at the temperature of liquid nitrogen, nothing much happens, and you can go for a long time without change. A thousand years is sort of the shortest period I've heard as a reasonable time period, <coughs> and in fact it looks like longer would be feasible. Uh, I don't think it will be necessary. And then finally, when we develop these nanomedical technologies, these molecular repair devices, then they can go ahead and revive you, and when you wake up, you say, ah, new future, new world, isn't that interesting? And then off on the right, you wander off into this new world. So that's, that's the basic sequence of cryonics. Well, the first phase looks an awful lot like a standard medical procedure, because it is a standard medical procedure. It involves the introduction of certain levels of cryoprotectants and ice blockers and other uh, solutions which are designed to cushion the tissues when you cool them down. And after you have introduced these uh, various solutions, you cool a tissue down to the temperature of liquid nitrogen. Now, at this point, I'd like to take a bit of a side journey. A lot of people say, well, you know, cryonics freezes the dead, and that's not actually accurate. 
Cryonics freezes the terminally ill, and the whole debate is, is the person dead or not? And this actually comes up quite a bit, because people become dreadfully confused about this, this word death. Um, what's going on is there are multiple definitions of the term death. There are current legal criteria, and under current legal and social practice, you have to be legally dead in order to initiate cryopreservation. There are sort of the criteria of death by current medical criteria. Is it the case that you could or could not be revived by current medical capabilities? And obviously, you could be declared dead at a point in time when, in fact, you could be revived. That's the whole point of DNR, or do not resuscitate orders. If you reject heroic measures, then you can be declared dead promptly upon cessation of heartbeat, even at a point in time when someone else who had a different intent, a different desire, would have been revived. The crash cart comes and revives them. So you have this interesting thing, which current definitions include all kinds of stuff, including the patient's intent, the intent, the desire of the treating physicians, and other variables. And then you have death by the criteria of, say, 100 years from now. And if you haven't heard of it, the, the, the new definition of death, this definition of death, which uh, I think is going to be used in the future, has been called the information theoretic definition of death. And basically that means if in principle you could be revived with your memories and personality intact, then you're not dead. And we've seen this confusion over the centuries because it used to be that you would be declared dead when you stopped breathing. Then we became more sophisticated and you would be declared dead if your heart stopped. Now we have more complex criteria. And looking down the road, we're going to see a big change in the criteria of legal death. So, okay, that's an aside. Uh, try, you know, it, when people use this word death, you have to ask them, what do they mean specifically? Okay, so once you've been cryopreserved and you're in liquid nitrogen, you stay there for a long time. Basically, it's a stainless steel thermos bottle. And it's, you know, can hold a person. They are not dependent on the electrical power grid, not directly. The liquid nitrogen can stay, you know, for about three months, and it's topped off weekly, so if suddenly the power goes away, not a problem. It's got to stay off for three solid months or more, because you have to disrupt the supply of liquid nitrogen before you're in trouble. Um, so once you're in liquid nitrogen, you're good for a long time. So that's the basic concept. This part seems to be relatively non-controversial in terms of what it is you're doing, what the effects are, how long you can stay in that state. <laughs>